You know, what do you need to, to describe the state of motion that's going between point A and point B? And so um, these are the things that we need. We need positions. And from those positions, calculating a distance in meters, usually. Uh, times. You know, so we have to read the clock a couple, three times or more. And then figure out lapse time, delta T, from those time stamps. Uh, we did not talk about it too much last time. We will talk about today uh, the directions of motion uh, and the speed. We did talk about the speed. And our homework uh, was a little bit of distance calculation and a little bit of speed calculation. Uh, and I want to go over uh, one of the homework problems with you uh, so that uh, we can, you know, just reinforce uh, some of the things. Are, uh, I, I noticed in discussions that there were some students asking me, hey, Dr. B, what do you do about this? What's the formula? How do you do this formula for, you know, for these problems? So let's take a look at this one. This is the a guy that walks into a door. Uh, and if you look at this, it I've specified it very carefully with an X coordinate and a time, co a T coordinate. Uh, for both events, uh, before he hits the door and at the moment that he hits the door over here on the right, okay? And so the basic task uh, was given some temporal and spatial coordinates, calculate delta x from the spatial coordinates, calculate delta t from the temporal coordinates, uh, and then calculate the average speed. And uh, here's a down here in the bottom half of this slide, this is an actual snapshot from, from the quiz or from the homework itself. Um, there's the data, event one and event two, uh, and the task cal to calculate the average speed. And then to, below that is a little paragraph where I specify how to type in the answer. Now let's look at this carefully. Uh, event 1 and event 2, there's an X and a T for each one. And this is a calculation problem. You might want to make a note of what I'm about to say. In Web Courses Canvas, on a calculation problem in which you type in the answer, you know, 7.2 or whatever the answer is, you're going to have, usually, if it's homework, four attempts. Every attempt, Web Courses Canvas generates a different, at least one different number that you calculate with. Now, in this problem, I think the only uh, change is T2. And it is possible for me to set it up so that all four numbers change ra or, uh, randomly between uh, events. Uh, so my point to you is when you're doing the second attempt and the third and the fourth, do not recycle the numbers, okay? Because they might be different. If you don't read carefully, you might miss that on attempt number two, T2 is equal to uh, 1.1 seconds. If you don't measure, if you don't mark that and use it, you might be doing the right calculation, but with the wrong numbers, and you're going to get it wrong. Right? So you don't want to do that. You want to replicate your strategy if you know it works, but not um, repeat the numbers or be alert to the possibility that you don't repeat the numbers. It's kind of randomized, and uh, I suppose some people get the same number two times in a row, but uh, it's, it's no way to predict it. Now, uh, below the task here where it says calculate, I always have a little paragraph there, and I want you to uh, be aware of that and be aware of what I'm about to tell you. I'll always tell you to enter the numeric part. I'm never going to ask you to type in meters per second. I only want the number, right? So if you're, and, and that's why I say, e.g., if your answer is 12.39 meters per second on paper, you know, on your scratch work or your notes, all I want you to do is type in the numeric part. 
12.4. And, and I always tell you how to round it off as well. See right here it says enter the numeric part of your answer to the nearest 0 0.1 meters per second. I'll always specify that if it's a calculation problem where you have to type in the answer. All right. Now most of my, sometimes I'll write a new problem for you and I may forget that, but usually um, I'll remember that and it, it'll, it'll look the same every time, but you got to read that carefully as well. Because sometimes they'll say, oh, I want the nearest 0 0.01 meters. Or I want the nearest whole number of Celsius degrees if we're working on thermodynamics or something like that. Okay. But I'll always specify it. So be aware of that. All right, let's get down to business. In this particular problem, uh, the first thing to calculate is delta x. Here's the formula for it. Uh, and I typed that in. I think a, a bunch of other people typed that into the discussion threads. By the way, discussions, the different threads that go, they can be like a virtual study group, and it can be really productive. So I highly recommend that you pepper it up and use it. Uh, X2 minus X1, it's always later minus earlier. It implies a temporal ordering for every measurement. And so for this one, the uh, later measurement is 0, 0.00 meters. The early one is negative 2.45 meters. Uh, so it's uh, 0, 0.00 meters minus a negative 2.45 meters. And remember, subtraction of a negative is the same as addition of a positive. So it's really 0, 0.00 meters plus 2.45 meters, right? And that's the answer. Now I'm going to, so this is the little calculation, and you might be able to do this mentally, but sometimes you got to write it down if it's a little complicated, and here it is written down. So we're going to go step by step, and I know some of you guys, I asked a show of hands last time for those who have had calculus, um, and we, in, in reality, we have a huge range of students, um, the math experience is, you know, a large range, so, but my, normally I'm going to go step by step. Uh, like we're doing right now. Okay, next step, figure out delta T. Uh, same basic delta formalism, uh, later minus earlier, T2 minus T1. In this case, it's a little bit easier, 0 0.8 seconds minus 0, 0.00 seconds. And that's equal to 0 0.8 seconds for delta T. So that's, that's, a, that's a good easy one. Okay, I'll park that over here to the upper right. And now we calculate the average speed. That's the quotient of the first two calculations. Okay, 2.45 meters on top, 0 0.8 seconds below, and then you calculate that out, and you come up to 3.0625. Now, I included all the digits on this one. Um, the problem in the homework asked you for the nearest tenth of a meter per second. So this is what your calculator is going to look like if you do this, all right? And it's all right to write that down in your notes and stuff, but then when you get to the problem itself, you got to type it in this way. Now, I want you to take note of this. Take a look at that. And, and this, is, this is actually a screen grab of Dr. B doing homework one so that I could teach you guys about doing homework one. And... I typed in 3.1, and you may have noticed this last night. It always types in a bunch of zeros, and I have no idea why they do that, and I have no idea how to turn it off. Nobody seems to know how to turn it off. Uh, so, and, and, and this was graded correctly, all right? So type in what I tell you to do, whether it's to the nearest point 0.1 or nearest point zero 0.01, and if you're in web courses, and ignore the zeros that they they pad it with. It's called padding with zeros. I don't know why they do that. But they do that. And so just, you know, just try to not be discombobulated mentally by all those zeros. All right. Now, questions about this calculation and so forth.
Yes. And it was right or it was... Yeah, I, um, it should work. Um, and as I said, it may be that you, you might have... Sometimes doing the calculator is a little flaky, you know, because you still have something left. You, have, you haven't hit the all clear button. You know, that happens to me every once in a while. But it should work. Um, and, and, but, but really... What you just mentioned is why you get four attempts. Right? And when we get deeper into the semester, there's going to be some real brain burners that I'm going to give you four attempts, and then the next night I'm going to give you another four on the same problem just to see if you can, you know, because they're going to be really tough. All right. Uh, all right. Let's look a little bit more carefully at this curved path. And we're going to go into some of the deeper details of describing the state of motion of an object. And uh, that's going to take us all the way to Galileo's famous experiment on the Leaning Tower of Pisa. All right, so let's take a look at this curved path. Um, a curved path, if you think about it, is more complex, more complicated than a straight path. I mean, you got to, for one thing, it takes up more graph paper, covers up a lot more graph paper. Um, to describe the motion requires a lot more info. Now, you're going to need positions and distances, same as before, but you're going to need a lot more points. If I just tell you the end point and the, the, the starting point and the finishing point and then tell you that it's curved, you don't know jack about where it was or where, uh, where it went, right? So you're going to need a lot more waypoints, like, for instance, point 0.6 and point 0.7. Go ahead and uh, jot down a couple points up there. Try to make it look like mine, I guess, if you want. And, you know, you, you're going to have more waypoints between your endpoints and so to figure out the total distance that you traveled, you're going to have to do, uh, you know, a curved path is going to be longer. You're going to wear your tires out a little bit more on this curved path than the straight path. So you need to do some more distance calculations, all right? Distance calculations, what does that bring to mind? Well, hopefully it brings to mind the Pythagorean theorem. So go ahead and... Uh, I've got this little teeny slivery yellow triangle up here. Um, there it is. And I'm going to blow it up and move it down to the lower right. So I'm going to just kind of, right? So there's the expansion of it. That's the same triangle. And what you're going to need to do with that triangle uh, is on scratch paper or what have you, figure out the distance. Remember, uh, if you're working in two dimensions, it's pretty easy to do a right triangle. If you got graph paper and stuff, you can, you know, usually figure out a good right triangle to use for the distance. Okay, that's the length of that hypotenuse. Uh, you're also going to have to make some time measurements. So you need more time stamps. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, you're going to need the time at point six the time at point seven all right uh and if you have that then you can figure out and uh the velocities and everything else like that all right so let's take a look at that okay um the velocities include a direction so the directions at each time so i've got my point six and point seven up here, and right down here where it turns from um, a right curve to a left curve, if you're going from point A to point B, first you're turning right, and then on the second curve you're turning left, if you think about it. Okay, right here where you're turning, where you're straightening out your steering wheel, I put in another point right here where my cursor is, toward the middle. Um, 
And so your, your direction of travel, if you will, if, if, if it's a car, your headlights will be shining in different directions. Okay. Uh, so for instance, this might be the velocity right here at point six. So what I do is I draw in a little arrow here with its tail on point six and just tangent, just barely touching it, that one point only, the curve, uh, the curved path, All right? The velocity vector, V6. Now, this one is V7. I made it a little bit longer to signify that it's faster there. And both of those are roughly to the northeast. They're pointing off to the right and a little bit up, All right? So... In shorthand terms, that would be northeast. All right. If you want to get into trig nerd uh, mode, you can figure out how many degrees, you know, like on a compass. Uh, but for us, northeast is good enough. Some of them are going to be southeast. Now, I've got another point here uh, where, where you're turning from a right-hand turn to a left-hand turn, um, and I'm calling that point eight. Here's the velocity direction. It's another arrow. And it's still pretty big. It's bigger than uh, V6 up here. Uh, but it's definitely in the southwest direction. Now, let me point something out to you in the notation. And I'm going to try to make this uniform during the semester. And that is, if I draw in a velocity or some other vector, uh, some directed quantity like this, in the diagram, I'll put a little teeny arrow symbol over the velocity symbol. That symbolizes that I'm talking about the speed and the direction. Inside an outline like this, I can't use that little arrow over the top of a letter, but I can use a different font. So look at this font for the expression V8. It's much thicker and darker. It's called Arial Black, and I'm going to try to use that to signify an, an arrow quantity like a velocity. And I'll use that if I'm in an outline or some kind of a little note or something like that. But if I'm actually out here in the sketch, I'll use this uh, notation, a little teeny arrow over the top of it. Okay, And there's other ways to represent vectors, but this will work for us. Now, so, so this is a little blurb about the directions. If you're on a curved path, that's another thing you have to specify, the directions, at as many times as you possibly can. And the more times that you have, uh, the more specifications you have, the more precise um, your information is about that curve. Another thing you need to do is to specify the speed. And I've done that already. I've made some of the arrows longer. V7 and V8 are longer. That means... That this car, uh, the driver of this car, if this were a track, uh, was kind of kind of pokey over here at point six, but then when he got into the straightaway, he started to really let it out. So he's got two longer arrows here. V7, he hasn't straightened it out yet. He's not heading southwest yet, or he's not heading southeast yet, uh, but he's getting faster and faster, and here he's He's on the straightaway at, at point 8, and so his V8 vector is uh, really long. Okay, so the basic idea is that you calculate the speed uh, from the distances and elapsed times. And I've got a little, um, a few pages in the textbook about the difference between an average time and an instantaneous time, and I highly recommend that you read that. The speeds that we have here in item four, uh, that could be something like a speedometer rating. Or here's another one that you see on TV sometimes. If you're watching baseball, they'll have a radar gun aimed at the pitcher's uh, throw. I don't know how they do that. They must have a, a radar gun right behind home plate, and they pick up the baseball speed as it comes towards the plate. You know, 90 miles an hour, 95, 100 if they're really hot. Uh, so those are speeds, okay? Um, now, vocabulary blurb about the word velocity. What does it denote? 
it is a very specific term in physics. And it means a quantity that has a direction and a magnitude. All right. Basically, it tells you, it's, it's an expression. If I tell you the velocity, I have to tell you not only how fast it's going, in other words, what is its speedometer reading, but what direction is it going? Is it going north towards Walmart to get some lunch? Or is it going south towards, uh, what's that place? Waterford Lakes to get Chick-fil-A. Or is it going west? So I see a guy in the back going, yeah, I want to get some Chick-fil-A. Is or is it going to west on university to get Chick-fil-A? Or is it just staying here on campus and getting Chick-fil-A right up here at the, at, by the bookstore? Anyway, uh, where are you going and how fast are you going to get there? That's all part of the idea of being able to predict the future of the physical state and the physical location of an object, whether it's you in your car or any other object. Did you guys hear about that rocket that blew up out of Cape Canaveral this morning, the SpaceX? Horrible. But apparently nobody was injured. It was, what's that? Yeah. Oh gosh, it's a good thing you guys didn't go today. Only time I ever went to watch a launch, it's got, I went to Titusville to see a night launch of the shuttle, but it got scrubbed, so we had to go home and I didn't see it. But you can see it from Orlando. Uh, anyways, apparently it blew up. Nobody was hurt, but it was, did anybody hear it? Because you can, did you ever, did you ever hear the space, raise your hand if, you, if you're from Orlando and you've heard the space shuttle, the, son, the double sonic booms from the space shuttle coming over. I was in traffic the first time I heard that. I thought, whoa, that was a good, you know, what is that? Is, is that a, I, I thought, whoa, a dump truck fell over, you know, or something like that. Because it, it felt, it was a boom, you know, it was like hollow, you know, it sounded like a, a, you know, an empty dump truck went boom on the ground. And then it happens again. I thought, whoa, two of them. And I thought, oh no, it's gotta be the space shuttle. Cool. So I was, I was stuck in traffic. I'm still enjoying it, you know, because I could, and I, I wouldn't have heard it if I'd been moving, you know, so it worked out. Anyways, vectors. We're going to work with more vectors than just velocity. We're going to work with acceleration vectors, force vectors, momentum vectors, angular momentum vectors, vectors all over the place. The longer it is, the faster. The shorter it is, the slower. So you want, want to make vector V7 longer as an arrow than V6. Or, saying it the other way, you want vector V6 to be shorter than whatever V7 is. Now, these vectors I was very, very careful to make um, different lengths. I made V, and you know, you might be able to make a note of it in your notes, Vector V7 and vector V8 are the same length, but they're different directions. Let me repeat that. Vector V7 and vector V8 are the same length, the same speed, but different directions. Vector V6 is shorter than either of them. So that's the slow one, and it's a different direction than either of the other two. All right. So this is some of the stuff that you have to... Uh, specify carefully to uh, describe the state of motion of an object. So in general, at any time t, you have to specify a position and a velocity. In Galileo's world, physical science, natural philosophy, as they used to say in the olden days, this is spe specific. Um, these are the conditions that you must know if you want to say that you know something about an, a moving object, this is what you must know. Also, if you want to predict something, you have to have some way to express the evolution over time of both position and velocity. All right, now, in this particular diagram here, I chose out another point, uh, point 
uh, 11, and here's its velocity vector, V11. Um, and so this, this little short list here in the middle right side of the slide shows you position, underlined, time, underlined, and velocity, underlined. And the position is x11, comma, y11, okay, on graph paper for us. Uh, T11, what was, the, what was the reading on the clock at, when it hit this point? And I just dreamed up a number here, 122 and 44 seconds p.m. And it's velocity. I've drawn it in. And, you know, you can, you can um, you know, if you want to get fancy, you can write, you know, how much horizontal speed does it have? How much vertical speed does it have? And you, you can do that. Just like the position, you can specify how many horizontal uh, meters does it have? That's x11. How many vertical meters does it have? That's y11. And you can do something like that with the velocity as well. But I just drew in the velocity vector here. Okay, so th this is the general thing that we want to be able to know and predict. In physical science, we want to be able to do that. That's our task. We're trying to think of it this way. We're trying to do the things that NASA does. You know, and they, they had a disaster over there this morning. The thing blew up. But I can guarantee you that there were a ton of PhDs trying to generate um, how big to make the rocket engine, how much fuel to put in it for the payload that they want to put up in space, and for the exact position, not more than a few meters high and low, not more than a few meters left and right or side to side of where they had to park that spacecraft. Huge technical problem. But basically, it boils down to making a big, huge list or a spreadsheet or a computer file of times, positions, and velocities. And how they evolve over time, that's why you have to be a PhD. you got to know how to do that. It's not very easy. But guess what? It all starts with stuff like this. Now, this is the um, distance rectangle that the morning class worked with. Here's the one um, that we worked with. All right. 2.8 meters per second. And we, we ran it for three seconds. The time evolution equation for this is actually just the simple delta x equals v delta t. Right? And that comes straight out of the, uh, the average velocity definition. V equals delta x over delta t. Just multiply both sides by delta t, and you get this equation. You get delta x on the left and v delta t on the right. right that. And that is what you would call a time evolution equation. Very, very uh, basic. If it's constant velocity, all, to know what delta x is, to know how the position changes over time, all you need to know is delta t. If the speed is constant, 2.8 or whatever it happens to be, all you need is, you, you just have to tell Galileo, okay, Galileo, I want to know where this is going to be in 3.5 seconds. And then Galileo would say, okay, I got it. Just multiply 3.5 times 2.8, V delta T. Ching, and that's where it's going to be. All right? Now, for something that's in free fall, you look at a graph like this. Now, we didn't get quite get to this one on Tuesday, but let's talk about it for a minute now. If you have something in free fall, it's going to have downward speed. It's going to start at zero. So right up here on the velocity graph, that's zero. It's starting at rest. But as time increases, it gets more and more downward speed. So it goes from negative one meter per second, and a little bit later, negative two meters per second. And so your, your uh, velocity graph is actually a slanted line. And what we're going to do is interpret the area of that polygon 
as the distance traveled for something in free fall. You know, we just did um, this one, the, the area of this polygon, it's a rectangle, that gives us the distance you travel at constant speed, no problem there. All right, velocity versus time graph. The polygon, whatever it is, is the area. Or excuse me, the polygon's area, whatever it is, is the distance traveled. And so we're going to apply that to this. All right? And that triangle, we're going to sketch it out first, and then we're going to get the actual equation of evolution. The time evolution equation for free fall. And in general, acceleration is going to look just like that. Now the, the time evolution equation for a general acceleration will look just like it. So let's go to Galileo. He's the one that kind of got this whole shooting match started back in the day, 400 years ago. 400 and change. Now, everybody's heard this story about Galileo. You know, he went up to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which still exists. And the legend says that he dropped a cannonball and a musket ball, which is a little bit smaller. You know, a musket, that's a big, a big rifle, primitive rifle, one of the earliest rifles. Cannonball, and they felt the same speed. They landed at the same time. And it's a legend because nobody took any selfies. You know, did, you know there's no photograph. There's no digital video uh, in Reddit about, you know, they didn't even have Reddit in those days. Uh, but his lab assistant, who later became a famous scientist in his own right, um, said, yeah, he did this. He, did, he actually did that. And Galileo didn't, didn't write... He didn't, uh, well, his notebook didn't survive. A lot of his writings didn't survive. Uh, some of them uh, were lost to time. You know, so his, his, uh, his, you know, like, you know how like your grandma, she starts cleaning the house and she throws that stuff that you've saved and she didn't know it was special and, she, you know, or your mom, you know. And so stuff like that happened to Galileo. But here's what, something he did write. So go ahead and jot this down. It's a quotation. I observe a stone initially at rest, falling from an elevated position and continually acquiring new increments of speed. And uh, who caught my, 12, my, my dollar bill? Where, where are you? Are you, she, what? She's skipping class? <laughs> oh, man. I guess she's out spending my big dollar bill. Um, anyways, that dollar bill started at rest. And then as it accelerated downward, it got faster and faster. Now, uh, I, does anybody remember her name? Carly. Carly. And then the other student was Sam. And Sam didn't catch it, but Carly did. And so it was too fast for Sam by the time it got past his hand. All right, so position and speed are changing. And Galileo described it this way, continually acquiring new increments of speed. Now, here's another thing that he wrote. If now we examine the matter carefully, we find no addition or increment more simple than that which repeats itself always in the same manner. And he attributed that to free fall. So let's make a little table of time and speed. We'll, we'll assume that his lab assistant is down at the bottom of the Tower of Pisa and he's got a radar gun. Sweet. And hopefully nothing breaks. He's down there, no chairs are breaking or anything like that. He's, he's making it. And so Galileo says, all right, I'm going to drop it from rest. And I'm going to start my stopwatch. Do you ever think about that? A stopwatch. You, it only works if you start it, but you call it a stopwatch. What? 
It's like you park on a driveway and you drive on a parkway. What? Anyways, we're going to start, start the stopwatch. And after one second, all right, here's, here he is, at time t equals zero, at rest. So this downward speed is 0, 0.0 meters per second. After one second, the downward speed would be 9.8 if he had a radar, you know, if his TA was holding the radar gun down at the bottom, okay? So it's pretty brave, you know, you got a cannonball coming at you, and you get your radar gun aimed at it, and you got to get, get out of the way at the last second, you know, so you got to be quick. Anyways, 9.8. Now, they didn't have the metric system in those days. They probably had cubits or feet or something like that. Uh, but I think they did have seconds of time and hours and minutes. And this is what they would have found if they'd had the metric system. After another one second of free fall, ching, another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Total, 19.6. Another second of free fall, three seconds, ching, 29.4. Anybody notice the pattern here? How about this? 9.8 times t, whatever t is, multiplied by 9.8, and that's what you've got for your free fall velocity. Hey, you guys, that is, that's enough data for us to make a velocity versus time graph, and we're going to do that in just a second. Let's do one more second of free fall. Four, four seconds, another 9.8 total, 39.2 meters per second. Now, that's a pretty tall tower. That would have to be something. I don't even know if the, no, nah, probably the Empire State Building is, is, you need more than four seconds. But Leaning Tower of Pisa, maybe one second or two seconds to get to the bottom. But anyways... If it was a really, really tall bonus version of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you might have four seconds of free fall. And if you did, it, you would have a, a speed of 39.2 meters a second. Make a side note to yourself that the direction is downward on this table. And just like a distance, a distance is always positive. A speed is always positive, if you think about it. I mean, your, your speedometer on your car doesn't have negative or anything like that. It's just always 0 to 50 miles an hour or however fast you're going, no matter what the direction is. Now, we're going to do something different with these numbers here uh, when we make a graph. Okay, so we start at 0 and 0, 0.0 meters per second. We end at 4 seconds of free fall and 39.2 39 meters per second. Uh, direction is downward. And here's the pattern. The increase repeats itself. It's always another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. For every second of free fall, you get another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. That's if you're on the way down. All right? And, that's, and we're just going to do straight down motion for today. And Thursday or Tuesday next week, we'll do three dim or two dimensions. The free fall acceleration at the surface of Earth is usually symbolized with the letter G, lowercase g, for gravity. From the top of Mount Everest, the, the highest point that you can go on the surface of the Earth, all the way down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the, Pacific, the Western Pacific, the deepest point in the ocean, the value of the acceleration of gravity is 9.8. There's various ways to measure it. Did you know that you can use a pendulum to measure the, the acceleration of gravity? It's pretty easy. So you would write it as G equals 9.8 meters per second per second. Or in compact form, 9.8 meters per second squared. So if I say that the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, that really means for every second of free fall, I get another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. Let me repeat that. And you can write it down. For every second of free fall, I get another 9.8 meters per second of downward speed. If I'm on the way down from the top of the Tower of Pisa. Now, in general, 
The general formula for the acceleration is simply the ratio of delta V over delta T. How much does the velocity change over time? And this is this formula here is going to allow us to figure out the time evolution equation for an object in free fall. So write it down. A equals delta V over delta T. And really, what we should write is next to that the other version of it. And go ahead. I don't have it on the slide, but go ahead and write it down. Delta V equals A delta T. In other words, take this equation, multiply both sides by delta T, and you get delta V equals A delta T. And that will be the time evolution equation for the velocity. And from that, we'll get the time evolution equation for position. So let's do it. We're going to work on that distance triangle now. Let's take a look at this. On this graph, I now have the same numbers, but now I'm putting minus signs in there. This is a velocity graph. The positive numbers up here, mean, you know, like a 9.8 means I'm going up. All right, but this is in free fall. It starts at zero. So here's your first dot right here where the two axes intersect. Zero comma zero. At time t equals zero, the velocity is 0, 0.0 meters per second. I release it from rest. And then after one second, okay, this first horizontal tick mark or the first tick mark on the horizontal axis, that's one second. I didn't want to crowd the picture here too much, so I didn't label one second, two seconds, but I did label five seconds. Right, so that's sufficient. So this is one second here, and then right here is negative 9.8. So there's your second dot. Whoa. Right, here's your second dot right here. Third dot. After two seconds, you're down at negative 9.6. You're really cooking. You're falling downhill. You're falling down, downward, 19.6 meters per second on the speedometer. So that's about 40-something miles an hour. And, uh, but you're going downward. So on this graph, we have to have a minus sign for it. After three seconds, 29.4. This should be a straight line. Now, you, you don't, probably don't have graph paper for your notebook. But... Try to make it a straight line. And here's four seconds out. And down here's, and I did this, this graph is accurate. I did this very carefully. All right. So here's four seconds. Now, for our distance rectangle, speed <coughs> times time, we figured, we, we looked at the velocity graph, a straight horizontal line. And we took the area between the velocity graph and the time axis. We do the same thing here. Go ahead and uh, sketch in your, your polygon, which is a right triangle, that goes from the velocity graph up to the time axis. All right? So, ugh, excuse me. Now, we're going to interpret the area of that as the distance traveled, as it drops from rest at the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. All right? And we know that, in general, for a triangle, it's one-half base times height. So let's figure out the base and the height. Okay, first thing to figure out, the height. Here it is. The change in the velocity is equal to g times delta t, all right? And it, it works out to 39.2, all right? No matter what the time is, if it's four seconds, this is what you got. If it's 20 seconds, you still use this formula here. You just have a different value of delta t. All right, what's the, so that's the height of the triangle, and it's an upside-down triangle, but you still do it that way. Here's the base, delta t. 
That's how long it's in free fall. All right. Now we can use um, delta T here for the base and G delta T over here for the height. And it's actually an upside down height, but all right. So I've got delta T times G delta T, and I've got a factor of one half out here. That's because it's a triangle. And here's what you get. One half GT squared. And here, my wonderful students, I've dropped the delta. All right. So now it's just, I could write delta T in parentheses quantity squared if I want to. But this is good enough. One half G times delta T, excuse me, one half G times T squared. All right. So this is the formula for the area of a triangle applied to this triangle, for which we know the interpretation. The area of this triangle is distance. And so my wonderful students, go ahead and make a star next to this equation. This is called the drop distance formula. Now, if you throw something down from the top of the library, if you throw something down from the leading tower of Pisa, you need a di slightly different equation. You'll still have 1 half gt squared in there, but you'll have some other stuff in there as well. But if you just drop it, you hold it in your hand, then go boom, and drop it. Yep, this is what you use. It is a distance. So it's always a positive number. If we're going to, and on Tuesday, we'll do a ballistic, a full baseball trajectory, a ballistic arc. And when we do that, we have to use minus signs and coordinate systems. But if you're just doing drop distance, it's all you need. Now, 1 half gt squared. Take your clicker out. Let's do a, a clicker question together. And this clicker question is going to be numeric. So what you have to do is use the arrow keys to go up and down and choose different numbers and then hit the send key. All right. So here's our example from the mines of Moria. Drop a rock down a well, just the way Pippin did. Peregrine took. And let's say that you hear the splash at 3.2 seconds of free fall. All right. How deep is the well? You use that formula. And if you're, if you're using your clicker for the first time, Hold the power button down until it flashes, and then type in AA, and that'll be good. And you can start to vote now. And if, if you want to collaborate and chat with your neighbor, I encourage you to do that if you have somebody sitting next to you. You can't do it on an exam, but you can do it here. Good. I see people interacting. Very good. Drop distance, one half GT squared. I see one guy up here in the front row, calculator in one hand, clicker in the other. Excellent. Good. Good. All right. And hey, you guys, start bringing your calculator to class. Just make it a practice. Put it in your pouch of your knapsack or what have you. We're going to need it pretty much every Tuesday, Thursday. Good. Good. This is what I like to see. J 
Chelsea. Good. Learning names. Names, names, names. What's that? If you if you have the number typed in, hit the send key. And then you'll get a check mark. Did you get a check mark? Okay. Very good. And students, just a little public service announcement while you're working. If ever you want to come up and get some extra coaching in class, come sit next to Caroline or sit next to Maria up here in the front. And I'm sure they'll be glad to help you out with calculating or anything else. One minute. Type in the numeric part of your answer to the nearest 0 0.01 meters of drop distance. Twenty seconds. Now, this is a practice question today, so it's not part of your official clicking. But Tuesday next week, yes, we will have official clicking for your semester grade. This one, you get a bonus point if you're registered. But Tuesday, you got to take care of business. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys are. Uh oh. We got a little bit of. We got a little bit of 31.38. Oh, you know what that is? That's 9.8 times 3.2. Is that right? 9.8 times 3.2? What is, I, some of these I don't, oh, look at that, 5.12, you know what that is? Decimal in the wrong place. Let's take a look at the answer. All right, here we go. Here's our formula. Go ahead and jot this down. We'll, we'll just go step by step. So if you got it, if you got 30, that one that was 32.96 or something, Better jot this down. Okay, one half. Here it is, 0 0.5 in the first parentheses. Second parentheses, good old 9.8 meters per second squared. And then over here, this is t squared, 3.2 seconds. Quantity squared. Now that's in square brackets. If you square the brackets, you have to square the 3.2 and you have to square the seconds. All right, so here's what it looks like. Okay, the first term here in parentheses is 4.9 meters per second. That's just 1.5 times 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so that's in, the, that's in the parentheses here. And then 3.2 seconds, quantity squared. All right, 3.2 squared is 10.24. And then second squared is right here, second squared. That's inside the parentheses. Now, I don't have any cancellation here, but if you look carefully, you can cancel something here. Raise your hand if you see it. Okay, what do you cancel? That's right, you cancel the second squared, S squared. All right, and if you do that, you're left with meters, M for meters. 
And that's good because we wanted distance. Meters, distance, right? And there's the answer. And that's pretty deep. It's a deep well. And so if you were going to type this, <coughs> excuse me, if you're going to type this into the nearest 0.01 meters, it would be 50.18. And so I think a few of you uh, messed up your decimal points, but it's no skin off your teeth. You know, the, the decimal point in this clicker is really bad. I should have turned the lights on for everybody. Uh, the decimal point is really hard to see. Anyways, that's how you get the answer. Uh, question. Nine point eight is in any free fall. If you're on this planet, it's good. G is always nine point eight. Yep, it's not universal, but it's uh, terrestrial. If you, in other words, if you're on the moon, it's a, a lower number. Okay, but on Earth, yep. All right. Uh, I hate to say it, but we're dismissing early. Homework two will be running at about one uh, one thirty, I think. You're dismissed. Come on up to the front if you want to double check your clicker registration. We can do it real fast. See you next week.